On Monday, we were looking at Gildas, the mid-6th century British writer who describes the Germanic invasions of Britain in the 5th century and the condition of Britain in his own day, all in somewhat apocalyptic terms. We looked at his Latinity, at the likely literary and cultural background from which he came, at the likelihood of some kind of halfway house between the classical grammatical school and the monastery as the background of his intellectual life, and above all, at the way in which he uses scripture. Oddly flexible about the text of scripture, he is at the same time determined to show that the history of the British people is a re-inscription of the history of Israel, not because the British as such are a chosen people, but because the British as a baptized nation naturally share the historical dynamic under which God's people live in the Old and the New Dispensation. And at the end of the earlier lecture, I noted that one of the things which Bede does in the early 8th century is to turn this picture upside down, to present the Germanic settlers themselves as the chosen people, and the British not even as unfaithful Israel, but as virtually non-Christian non-Jewish pagans. However, to understand some of the background of that, we once again have to look at Bede's own formation and at Bede's own library. And in contrast to the extremely obscure question of Gildas' background and education, we know really rather a lot about Bede's background and indeed about Bede's library. Simply because Bede was such a ceaselessly prolific writer, he has left a lot of quotations which allow us to gauge the extent of his scholarship. We know, for example, that the library in the monasteries of Wearmouth and Jarrow in his day included many works by St. Ambrose, a great deal of the Corpus of Jerome's work and the histories of Rufinus. Jerome and Rufinus we've already seen in Gildas's library. But in addition, of course, by this time, we have the work of Pope Gregory the Great. We have some of the work of Tyconius and Augustine. We have the encyclopedic work of Isidore of Seville, the etymologies. And we have, once again, echoing but enlarging what we find in the case of Gildas, a small but significant body of secular classical literature. Virgil, unsurprisingly, surfaces once again. No library was complete in the early Middle Ages without Virgil, as indeed no library should be complete now without Virgil. <laughs> but we also find Macrobius and Pliny, Pliny's Natural Histories, being a text that Bede will refer to several times. But one of the things which differentiates Bede's library from whatever library Gildas was able to use somewhere in Western Britain sometime in the mid-sixth century is the quality and the focus, the intellectual focus, of the biblical text he was using. And this is where, of course, in Bede's case, we have one of the most substantial pieces of material evidence that we could have in the shape of the Codex Amiatinus. One of the three great manuscripts of the Vulgate, the by now official Western Latin translation of the Bible, one of the three great manuscripts of the Vulgate commissioned and executed at the Tyneside Monastery, taken by Abbot Scholfrith on his last pilgrimage to Rome the abbot dying in Gaul seems to have left the manuscript to his colleagues to dispose of, and by a very complicated story, it ended up in an Italian monastery, hence Amiatinus, Amiata, only recognized 
in the 19th century for what it was. That is one of those three great gift books prepared in the monastery. And that's not just a matter of the production of literary luxury goods in Northumbria. It has to do with the definitive establishing of a text of the Vulgate that could be referred to as authoritative in the monastery and more widely. In contrast to Gildas's rather laid back approach to the biblical text, quoting from the old Latin or the Vulgate or memory as suited him. This time we have a fixed text, a definitively orthodox version of scripture. And Rosalind Love in her work on this has pointed out that it's a text which insists very strongly on its Romanness, its Romanitas. The illustration of the text is famously executed in a subclassical style. And in the very well-known illumination showing the scribe Ezra at work in his library, we see not only the figure of someone scribbling notes on a pad on his knee, but a large cupboard containing a number of codices laid flat on its shelves. The sheer physical space of the library is delineated there, and it's evidently a late Roman library, working library. So the Codex Amiotinus is a sign both of the need for an authoritative single text of scripture and the need and of the need to associate that with Romanness, with that profoundly important identity which Bede insists on throughout his ecclesiastical history for the English church, its Roman parentage and Roman orthodoxy. But we shouldn't, of course, run away with the idea that the library at Wearmouth Jarrow consisted entirely of massive, unwieldy codices. Krista Hamill, in his wonderful new book on manuscripts, notes that the Codex Amiotinus weighs as much as a 12-year-old child. <laughs> there were smaller handbooks available, and as it happens, we have a tiny fragment of one of them of a text on vellum which contains a small fragment of the first book of Maccabees. So in addition to the great formal public versions of the biblical text, there were also, it would be ambitious to say, pocket Bibles, but certainly smaller codices containing perhaps selections of relevant extracts for various purposes in preaching. It was a library which contained probably a good 200 volumes. They'd been assembled in the foregoing decades, partly by the initiative of those great figures to whom Bede looks in his recent past, Abbot Benedict Biscop and Abbot Jolfrith, two compulsive book collectors whose travels on the continent, especially those of Biscops, had led to an accumulation of codices from Gaul and Italy including probably some volumes in Greek, as well as very likely some volumes from Ireland. We do see an interesting representation of Greek fathers in Latin translation in Bede's quotations, but it's quite likely that there were at least some fragments or some smaller volumes which were actually in Greek. All of this makes sense because Bede himself was a theologian and an exegete in a way that Gildas never was. Gildas, you might say, is happier using scripture as a weapon to beat his fellow countrymen with than as a field in which you can ramble in order to edify yourself and your audience. And yet, Bede, in the ecclesiastical history certainly, is as much a theologian of history and a polemical theologian of history as Gildas is. And I want this evening to explore some of the sources and some of the themes in Bede's theology of history and theology of the chosen people. 
because to explore those issues gives us some rather unexpected insights into the less well-known corners of Bede's reading. As I said at the beginning, we have good evidence about the sort of thing generally Bede is quoting. And there have been a number of excellent articles on Bede's library, listing the works he almost certainly had access to. Recent scholarship, and I'll come back to this in a moment, has suggested that some of the earlier estimates of the amount of St. Augustine that was available to him in the library at Jarrow might be a little modest, that perhaps there was rather more that he used. But to turn now to the question of his theology of history. Gildas had, of course, castigated the British for their sins. He had told them that, like ancient Israel, they had been brought into the covenant of God and had betrayed it, and so earned punishment. But by enduring their punishment patiently, and by responding with repentance, they would find their way back to grace. Bede, as I've said, sees the British as barely Christian at all. And one odd feature of his narrative in the ecclesiastical history is that he will implicitly treat the Germanic settlers, the Anglians and the Saxons, as if they were some kind of chosen people, some kind of reflection of Israel, even before they're converted. So at the very end of book one of the ecclesiastical history, chapter 34, Bede mentions the ravages of King Athelfrith of Northumbria, who established his dominion over an unprecedented number of British territories, kingdoms one imagines, who slaughtered a large number of the indigenous inhabitants of the nation, and who in this respect, says Bede, somewhat um, eyebrow-raisingly, re resembled King Saul in the Old Testament. Saul liberates his people from the Philistines. He destroys Philistine cities and reduces the Philistines to subjection. The Philistines, foreigners and idolaters, are destined to be subject to the chosen people. And so here, Athelfrith, the new Saul, by his record slaughtering of British and submission of British territory, earns his place as, in inverted commas, a king of Israel. It's probably also true that Bede uses this typology to imply that Edwin, um, the slightly later king of Northumbria, who is the first Christian monarch of the territory, Edwin is a new King David. But that's another matter. The odd and interesting thing is how the Anglo-Saxons appear already to be Israelites. Thereby, of course, casting the British in the role of Canaanites, Philistines, idolaters, the natural victims and the natural subjects of God's chosen. An unhappy adumbration of the rhetoric of Afrikaners in South Africa and indeed a good many other colonial powers, but that's another story. Bede actually seems to have got more annoyed about the British rather than less as he got older. He had made some rather sidelong and indirect remarks on the subject rather earlier when writing his commentary on the Song of Songs, a slightly unusual place, you might say, to find polemic of this kind. But Bede's commentary on the Song of Songs is explicitly designed as a counter to popular heresies, especially the heresies he associates in particular with British people. Pelagianism, especially, to which I'll come back in a moment. But what he does in the commentary on the Song of Songs is to speak about the necessary unity of the Catholic Church, the danger posed to the true church by the synagogue, that is by a kind of Jewish mentality persisting into Christian times, which resists sharing the good news with people who are of different ethnic background. 
just as Jewish Christians in the New Testament on Bede's reading do not want to see Gentiles becoming Christians, so there are those in the church now who do not want to convert the pagans, but want to keep themselves to themselves. And since one of his most frequent complaints about the British church is that they failed to evangelize the Anglo-Saxons, it's not very difficult to see who he's talking about here. So at this phase of his writing, Bede seems to think that the British church and the British people are, so to speak, Jewish old covenant people as opposed to truly Christian new covenant people. They are the synagogue. But by the time he comes to write the ecclesiastical history, the situation is even worse. The British church and the British people are not even the synagogue. They are the Canaanites and the Philistines. So Bede's attempt to construct a history of the English church and people, Historia Ecclesiastica Gentis Anglorum, is one which requires him, so he believes, to reconfigure the story of who and where God's people are in Britain. God's people are the Angli. They are the Germanic settlers brought over by divine providence from continental Europe to chastise the infidelity and the apostasy of the British. Bede is able to use quite a lot of Gildas to reinforce this. Gildas's castigation of the British of his own day becomes, in Bede's hands, a means of confirming that conviction that the British are wicked, heretical, cowardly, and all the rest of it. Gildas, I think, would have been slightly alarmed at the use made of what he says, because, as you well know, anti-Welsh jokes can only be told by Welsh people. And it would be rather an unhappy um, consequence if the kind of anecdote I grew up on in South Wales about people in Cardiganshire would be, could be relayed to people in England as if it truly and accurately described the admirable citizens of that county. But Bede is delighted to find in Gildas about as much information as he needs to portray the British as a lost cause. But there's more to it. The British are not only wicked, cowardly, and all the rest of it. They are also crucially, absolutely crucially, heretical. And this is where the next stage of Bede's investigation and Bede's argument opens. As I've said, Bede is extremely interested in the particular heresy he associates with Britain. That is Pelagianism. He records boldly in his chronicle that in a certain year, Pelagius the Briton attacked the grace of God. The history of Pelagius' own work and the details of his theology are beyond the remit of these lectures. But it's worth saying very simply and very briefly that Pelagius was almost certainly a lawyer by training with some smatterings of Stoic philosophy. We don't know whether he was educated in Britain or outside Britain, but his British origins are beyond doubt. His protest against what he saw as an extreme doctrine of grace associated with the name of the African Bishop Augustine of Hippo led him to develop in a number of letters and also biblical commentaries a distinctive doctrine of how grace and human freedom intersect, a doctrine in which he insisted with great consistency on the power of human free will as something which was not destroyed or affected by the fall of Adam. Every human individual retains the capacity to respond in freedom to God's gift of salvation, and grace, therefore, is something earned by our efforts, not simply given, as Augustine wanted to argue, from above. This doctrine was largely repudiated in the fifth century, not only by Augustine, 
but by the ecclesiastical establishment around the Mediterranean. At the same time, there were many critics of Augustine's view who regarded it as unduly emphasizing the power and liberty of God at the expense of the power and liberty of humanity. Those like Faustus of Rie, whom I mentioned on Monday, the British-born abbot of Lerins and later bishop, who criticized both Augustine and Pelagius in his really rather impressive treatise on grace in the middle of the fifth century. But for Bede, Pelagianism is the golden, or rather not very golden, thread which connects together all the weaknesses of British Christianity. And in every book of the ecclesiastical history, Bede takes care to remind us that the British church, almost from its beginnings, has been weak, vulnerable to corruption, and in need of help from abroad. This help, frequently offered, is regularly refused. So when the British refuse both the help of the Roman mission at the end of the sixth century and the task of evangelizing the Germanic settlers, it's pretty much what you'd expect given their record. And part of the argument, part of the narrative of the ecclesiastical history is to show exactly this. From the beginning, the British have been proud and arrogant and incompetent altogether. Their pride and arrogance make them refuse the remedy for their incompetence. And the result is disaster, spiritual disaster. A disaster which reduces them to the level of being Philistines or Canaanites. Now, exactly how much of a problem Pelagianism really was in Britain in the fifth century remains a topic of some considerable debate. I've argued myself that it's been vastly exaggerated for a number of reasons, which I'll come to in a moment. But it's also true that Bede, in writing about this, seems to exhibit a very limited knowledge of the primary literature of the theological controversy. He never directly quotes Augustine on the subject, which is surprising. He does quote directly from one of Pelagius' own works, but ascribes it to the wrong author. So he's familiar only in a rather confused way with where the controversy actually began. And that's, in fact, not so surprising. By the time Bede wrote, the controversy about Pelagius' teachings and Augustine's had raged in Gaul for a century and a half, off and on. And in Gaul, it had become customary, and some of you may recognize this as a trend in ecclesiastical controversy, it had become customary in Gaul to assume that anybody who disagreed with Augustine's more extreme positions must be a Pelagian. That is, if you disagreed with somebody's version of orthodoxy, you couldn't be orthodox at all in any sense. So anything less than Augustine's extremely austere doctrine that some people might be predestined to damnation, anything short of that was regarded as Pelagian, and is still sometimes in rather unhelpful textbooks described as semi-Pelagian. It isn't, of course, semi-anything. It's simply the denial of Augustine on a rather bad day. But there were powerful voices in mid-5th century Gaul which insisted on that standard of orthodoxy. And the lives of various great figures of 5th century Gaul, as well as the controversial literature of the period, demonstrate how that map of the ecclesiastical territory was constructed. Prominent among those is the life written by the monk Constantius of Germanus of Auxerre. Germanus, a very great bishop and teacher who had before his conversion and ordination been a prominent military man in late Roman Gaul, Germanus visited Britain in the early fifth century, at least once and quite possibly, as the life suggests, twice. 
In Constantius's life, this is represented as a case of Germanus visiting Britain at the request of the British church and also at the request of a synod in Gaul or possibly a papal decree, another source suggests that, in order to root out Pelagianism. Broken down into its details, it's fairly clear that we can have no certainty at all this was ever the case. Germanus undoubtedly visited Britain, and it may very well have been in connection with the son of a Gaulish bishop who had taken refuge in Britain after ecclesiastical condemnation in Gaul, quite possibly for, in inverted commas, Pelagianism. But that doesn't quite add up to the epidemic of rampant heresy, which Constantius supposes to have existed in Britain, requiring foreign intervention. However, the life of Constantius is exactly the kind of volume that Bede will take from his shelves in order to prove his point that this is exactly, once again, what you would expect from the British church. The life of Germanus is an authoritative text, the life of a very great saint. Bede reproduces a number of significant anecdotes from that text and constructs his story around it of a fifth century British church buckling under the weight of heretical misapprehension in need once again, of foreign assistance, receiving it somewhat grudgingly and only temporarily. As soon as Germanus's back is turned, you might say, the British revert to their old ways. In spite of the fact that the Pelagians in Britain have been confounded in public debate by Germanus, not only by words but by deeds, because Germanus performs miracles in order to prove the rightness of his theological case. So, in the very first book of the Ecclesiastical History, one of the volumes of Bede's library that is prayed in aid most directly is a text which sets the scene for the remaining four books of the history in terms of the, what you might call, the invalidation of the British claim to be part of the chosen people and the true Catholic Church. Refusing this assistance from abroad, they become either a synagogue of recalcitrant, unbelieving Jews, the typology is, as I say, to be found in the commentary on the Song of Songs, or worse than that, the British have said no to the dispensation of grace. At least once in every one of the books of the history, as I've said, Bede returns to this theme or to something closely related to it. And towards the end of the history, in the long letter which he quotes addressed to the King of the Picts, um, over the signature of Abbot Chulfrith, though probably drafted by Bede, the point recurs in a very complex and recondite way in connection with the existing debate with the British Church over the date of Easter. Bede ingeniously manages to argue that the way the British calculate the date of Easter makes them heretical. Because they refuse the computers which Bede uses and which the rest of the Western Church by that time was using to decide the date of Easter, they are in danger of celebrating Easter before the first new moon after the spring equinox. That means they are anticipating the light of Christ dawning on the world. They believe that they have reached, says Bede, perfecta justitia, perfect righteousness, before the grace of God has completed its work. So to celebrate the passion and resurrection of Jesus Christ before the paschal new moon has fully risen is to show yourself a Pelagian heretic resistant to the grace of God. As I've said, it's a very ingenious argument. It takes several pages to unfold. I don't recommend you read it straight away, <laughs> but it's a fascinating piece of polemic. I mention in passing, just because it interests me, 
Bede's use of the phrase perfecta justitia, their perfect righteousness. And I have argued elsewhere that there must be a case in that event for supposing that Bede might at least have known some bits of Augustine's treatise De Perfectione Justitiae, on the perfection of righteousness. Not least because in that text, as elsewhere, Augustine uses a phrase about the Christian life, recte currere, running rightly, running in the right direction, which Bede himself uses in the commentary on the Song of Songs, where he discusses some of these issues about grace and freedom. So I suspect that there may have been a copy of Augustine on the perfection of righteousness somewhere in Wearmouth Jarrow, as well as Augustine's other works. Speculative, but I would be prepared to defend it. It's a very annihilating judgment on the British church as well as the British people, and of course, Bede doesn't distinguish particularly between the two, because, oddly, as much as Gildas, he assumes that the British are, as you might put it, a post-Christian rather than a pagan people. That is, they are Christian apostates rather than straight pagans, but that makes them, for all practical purposes, pagans. And we've seen how Bede uses his sources from outside Britain, especially the life of St. Germanus, to make this point. Unwittingly, and I think it is unwittingly, drawing the ecclesiastical history of 5th century Britain into the politics of 5th century Gaul, where they don't necessarily belong. But he's also clearly got a rather bad conscience about some of this because he recognizes that some Christians who refuse to abide by Roman practice, mainstream Western Christian practice, are nonetheless exemplars of quite impressive Christian life. Famously, he is profoundly sympathetic to St. Aidan and, in general, is quite kind to the Irish missionaries who are at work in northern England. And although those Irish missionaries were themselves directly influenced by and often directly taught by teachers from Western Britain, Bede systematically ignores this in a way which allows him more or less to say that while the English are very good, the Irish are quite good if misguided, and the British wholly bad. But there is something about the non-Roman indigenous Christian tradition which evidently nagged at him a little. And I want at this point to suggest another source for Bede, another part of his polemical library, which has not been very much investigated. And this is what I think comes into play right at the beginning of the second book of his history. This is where the mission of Augustine to Britain is being described, that is Augustine of Canterbury. Augustine, sent by Pope Gregory to evangelize the Angli, is given ecclesiastical authority over the church in the islands of Britain. No one, however, seems to have consulted the existing Christian communities in Britain about this. And unsurprisingly, Augustine's encounter with the British bishops already at work in Britain was not a very successful one. Bede's story is quite well known. The British bishops are summoned to a meeting with Augustine. Like Germanus, and it's a story quite clearly modeled on the story of Germanus, like Germanus, Augustine proves his point by a miracle. A sick Saxon is brought in and prayed over by the British bishops unsuccessfully, Augustine duly heals him. The British bishops then admit that they were wrong, but say they have to go back and explain all this to their congregations. There then follows a very strange episode. The British bishops on their way to a second meeting stop off to discuss the matter with a holy hermit. How will they know if Augustine truly has spiritual authority over them? The hermit replies, if he is truly a man of God, he will display humility towards you. 
if he rises to greet you, when you enter the hall, you will know that he is a man of God. The British bishops arrived at the meeting place. Augustine duly remained in his seat, and the rest is history. <laughs> but before they walked out, Augustine pronounced a curse on them, reminding them that they had failed to take the gospel to their new Germanic neighbors, and that therefore they could expect disaster. And sure enough, just a couple of years later, 1,200 monks from the great monastery of Bangor on Dee, not far from Chester, were killed by King Athelfrith, no less, at the Battle of Chester. Their wicked hosts were destroyed by the Angles, and so their heresy, as Bede calls it, was duly punished by the death of the body, as well as the punishment designed for the soul. It's a very strange chapter, not just because I think it shows Bede at his least attractive, but also because of the very construction of the story. There's the awkwardness of the imitation of the life of Germanus. There's the return of the bishops, the British bishops, to seek support in their congregations. And there's the apparently perfectly sound advice given to them by the Welsh hermit, and Augustine's failure to live up to a model of humility. Bede is a great admirer of humility in bishops. It's one of the reasons that makes him love St. Aidan and dislike St. Wilfred so much. So what is going on? The key is in the names. We actually have here two names of British people involved in the narrative. The leader of the delegation at the second meeting with Augustine is a formidable Welsh saint, we're given to understand, by the name of Dinaud, known to later Welsh tradition as St. Dinaud, connected in that tradition with St. Daniel of the other North Welsh Bangor anger in um, Carnarvonshire. We're told also that at the Battle of Chester, the British monks from Bangor on Dee were to be protected by a detachment of soldiers led by a British commander called Prochmile. Now, Bede never gives British names, apart from this chapter. There's only one other clearly British name in the Historia where in passing he mentions, presumably, a British king in probably mid-Yorkshire. So what are these two names doing here? Names which appear in impeccable 6th or 7th century Welsh-British orthography. The simplest solution is that he has a British chronicle of some kind in front of him. And the obvious candidate would be some kind of paschal chronicle from a monastic setting. Every monastery worth its salt in the early Middle Ages will have, of course, a table of Easter dates, including the marginal annotations, which eventually turn into paschal chronicles. This is the date of Easter for this year, and incidentally, in this year, the following major events happened. So it wouldn't be entirely surprising to find British monasteries producing Paschal Chronicles of this kind. Fairly sketchy, but it's not, I think, too great a stretch of the imagination to think of one such text in which an entry like Bishop Denote and his brethren meet the Bishop Augustine and a small anecdote appended. Just as in any account of the massacre of the monks at the Battle of Chester, one might imagine a similar little pericope added. Brockmile, who should have defended them, abandoned them to their fate at the hands of the Gentiles. One further small piece of evidence for some such British chronicle 
is in the account of the first arrival of the Anglo-Saxons in Britain. It's the famous story of Hengist and Horsa. In Gildas's version of the story, they are invited to Britain by someone who is simply called a superbus tyrannus, a proud tyrant. Not necessarily a tyrant in the modern sense, because tyrannus at that time essentially meant a self-appointed monarch. So that superbus tyrannus is more or less some jumped up usurper who convenes a council which disastrously invites the Saxons into Britain. Bede is the first to give this person a name as Vortigern. And the name appears both in the chronicle and in the ecclesiastical history. The spelling in the two places is different. Vertigernus in the chronicle is a slightly later way of spelling the name, but in the history we have very scrupulously Vortigernus spelled in, once again, an impeccable 6th, 7th century Welsh-British style. And those three names, Vortigern, Dinaud, and Brockmile, are, I would suggest, the evidence we need to propose with some credibility that Bede had access to a written British source. Where did he get it from? After the defeat of the British-Irish party at the Synod of Whitby in the middle of the seventh century, many houses, monastic houses, following the Irish-British rule with the indigenous form of the tonsure and the indigenous dating of Easter and various other customs, no doubt, many such monasteries were taken over fairly forcibly by some of the more aggressive of the Roman party, not least St. Wilfred. And Wilfred's biographer, Stephen of Ripon, tells us of Wilfred's extirpation of Celtic custom in the monasteries and other churches of Northumbria and Yorkshire, and presumably by this time also Lancashire and Cumbria, which were now part of the Northumbrian political area of influence. Quite clearly, one of the things you would want to get rid of from any monastery would be a table of Easter dates, giving you the wrong dates for the festival. It's quite possible, I think, that some of Wilfred's colleagues, with perhaps a little more um, scholarly conscience than Wilfred himself, might have thought, I know somebody in Jarrow who'd be interested in reading this. So I believe that part of Bede's library is, in fact, some kind of British chronicle, very sketchy and very inchoate, but nonetheless representing a set of traditions and narratives, which Bede is prepared, if not to accept without question, at least to take seriously enough to incorporate into his own text, his own narrative, to add a little further dimensionality to it. And as I've indicated, I think the awkward platting together of what I would argue are two different versions of the story of Augustine's meeting with the British bishops, one written from the British, one from the Roman point of view, does give you a clue to Bede's scholarly conscience, which, although it didn't entirely rescue him from the sharp-edged polemic with which that narrative ends, does at least let us know that he was not a man dishonest enough to ignore primary material. All of that is, of course, a matter of detail, and you may think rather nitpicking detail. But given that we know quite a lot about Bede's Latin and continental sources, quite a bit about his use of Gildas and of the history of Erosius and the Chronicle of Zosimus and the familiar documents that others of the time use, it's not insignificant that he seems also to have had some access 
to indigenous documentation of the events he describes. An indigenous documentation which, if it doesn't exactly undermine or qualify, very slightly shades the primary colours of his main narrative of British apostasy and English chosenness. And so to return to the main theme, he is consistently configuring the gens anglorum, the people of the Angles, as God's chosen. But there's some irony here. The ecclesiastical history ends on what's generally a positive note. The British, with their heresies, their violence, their stupidity and obstinacy, are now largely confined to the western parts of the island and largely subject to Anglian or Saxon rule. There are record numbers of vocations to monasteries in Northumbria. There's a moderate level of political stability in the eastern part of the island. And yet, not very long afterwards, Bede writes his lengthy letter to Egbert about the problems of church and society in the 730s. By this time, things are a great deal less sunny. There may be lots of vocations to monasteries, but many of the monasteries are already deeply corrupt, owned by lay people and regarded as something rather like holiday homes for members of the aristocracy's families. They have been redefined as something rather like a tax dodge. Give your land to a monastic foundation and you can reduce your level of taxation and you can do pretty much what you like with any monastery you choose to found on the land. That's the picture that Bede paints. And there are many other problems that he spells out, notably um, dusting off Gildas's own polemic against the British redirected towards his own people in two respects. One of the things which Gildas reverts to frequently and which Bede himself has mentioned in the ecclesiastical history is the unwillingness of the British to defend themselves. They don't have an effective policy against attack from outside. They don't have the military skills and strategic resources to combat invasion and assault. So it's not surprising if they lose all their battles. And now in the 730s, what do we find? Exactly the same problem in Northumbria. The Anglian settlers are losing their military skills. They are opening themselves to attack from outside. It's a prophetic Remark, you might say, because the first Viking raids are just over the horizon of the North Sea. But it's an interesting echo of the way Gildas configures his polemic. And perhaps more significantly, in the context of literary heritage and literary strategy, Bede does what Gildas does. He turns to the history of the chosen people in Hebrew scripture and says, just as the prophets castigated Israel in the old days, just as Amos and Isaiah and Zechariah attacked the chosen people for their infidelity, so now the clergy must rise up and castigate the gens anglorum. So Bede has arrived in the 730s pretty much at the place where Gildas was in the 540s probably. That is, with a theology, not simply of the gens anglorum as the chosen people, but in a sense slightly closer to Gildas' own usage, a theology of the gens anglorum as part of the Catholic Church which is the present and true Israel, and which is therefore subject to prophetic denunciation and castigation at the hands of saints and prophets. It's interesting that in this letter to Egbert, Bede quotes the New Testament rather more than Gildas does, and it's very typical, I think, of Bede's overall theological mentality, 
that he is far less inclined than Gildas to focus on that Old Testament history, far more inclined to construe the present need for a critique of the English people through the lens of a St. Paul rather than an Amos or a Zechariah. But having invented England in the ecclesiastical history, invented England as the home of a chosen people, a people specially graced and specially called by God, having veered very close to a theology which sees the gens anglorum as already blessed and chosen even before they're baptized, King Athelfrith as King Saul, he's now, towards the end of his life, coming towards a position slightly more like that of Gildas. The chosenness is not about ethnic particularity as such. To be part of the chosen people is to be part of a community established by God's grace, therefore subject to God's law and judgment. So Bede leaves us with two not entirely reconciled theological models, something that is at the end of the day quite close to Gildas a use of scripture to retell the story of his own people as the story of yet another unfaithful baptized community. But at the same time, a somewhat more troubling story of a people chosen simply as a people, recipients of exceptional grace merely in virtue of who they are. And that, combined with the conquest and displacement trope that we've looked at throughout this lecture, means that there is indeed the seed of some of those profoundly ambivalent theologies of election and power, which we do indeed find in the post-Reformation period and in modernity. Those in South Africa who in recent years have complained about the use of the Book of Exodus in Latin American liberation theology because it's based on a people coming in to displace another people, would, I think, have found interesting material for discussion, to put it mildly, in Bede. But one of the key differences with Gildas, as I've already suggested, is that for Bede, scripture is already a somewhat more fixed and final thing. That massive and literally weighty codex implies both a new standardization of the biblical text, and Krista Hamill mentions in passing, of course, that elements of the Amiotinus text may themselves have been checked by Bede's own scholarship. He will have seen that text. Not only a new standardization of the biblical text and the scholarship that surrounds it, but a new and authoritative glossing of the biblical text to establish the Anglian identity, an invention of England. The Welsh have always been reluctant to let the English have a la the last word in any argument. And the deeply negative characterization of the Western British by Bede was not to go without challenge. A hundred years later, we find the response to Bede constructed in the courts of North Wales by scholars of the court of King Mervyn in the early ninth century. A response which does not simply seek to reinscribe Gildas which does not try to reread the biblical story, but which turns to two flanking movements. First of all, describing the roots of British identity as going back far before the days of baptism. And secondly, by noting that for all Bede's complaints about the evangelistic inferiority of the British, they have nonetheless produced, and I look here to the 
relatively recent work of Nick Hyam of Manchester, they've produced both a Moses and a Joshua. They've produced a St. Patrick and a King Arthur. They have produced, in a way which Gildas and Bede would both have been surprised at, a giant of the spiritual life and a giant of military strategy. And at the heart of the Historia Britonum of the ninth century, those two figures stand as the reproach of the British to the English and the vindication of the British against both their own Gildas and the Anglo-Saxon bead. More of that next week. Thank you. Thank you.